Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the first class session for ITCC 2413 Cisco 3. I'm going to wait about two or three more minutes to allow some more people to uh, join this session, and then we'll get going with today's stuff. Okay, looks like it's about 9.02. Looks like audio is working. This session is being recorded, so uh, if you want to re-view, uh, it's being recorded to an MP4 file with video and audio, and I will post it in the recorded uh, recorded lectures uh, session of my TCC Blackboard after the session is over. So uh, those of you who couldn't make it to the class will be able to watch it later. If you're here now, you can go back and review material if you need to. Okay, so here's what we need to cover today. Um, does this, here we go, there we go. So today is gonna be uh, uh, the first session and I'll cover uh, very briefly, we're gonna go over the, the instructor course requirements, which I misspelled, a syllabus, which normal people would call, a few changes this semester in grading scheme. And of course, we everybody got kicked off campus, so we're doing it via remote online stuff. Um, I'll show the black TCC Blackboard. I've added a couple sections to that like for this uh, my Collaborate software, which is not a nickel's difference between Blackboard Collaborate and Cisco WebEx. It's a group, work group collaboration software. Um, the Network Academy chapter assessments are uh, going to be active 24 hours a day like they were last time. And we'll talk about the slight change in the grading scheme on that. Today, I'm going to cover well, your assignment is to read the mod chapter modules one and two, but I'm gonna go ahead and cover those slides today. And then they'll be put up later as a recorded a lecture on my TCC. And then I'm gonna go into a little bit of how the packet tracer works, the packet tracer software, and step through a little bit of this 272 lab and show you how that works. Um, uh, okay, so let's see now. First of all, I need to start sharing the, uh, the IRC, ICR. And there's sometimes a little bit of lag in here with the uh, Collaborate software until something shows up on the screen. But what you should be seeing now is the top part of the PDF file that you can see from the uh, uh, web advisor 
click on the blue section course number and you get the, the syllabus or what those education is called the instructor course requirements. So my office hours are the same as they were last time. Email address is the same. Um, they have moved up the refund schedule since we were able to have to start a week later and we didn't get a week back at the end of the semester. So we're going to be hitting the floor running on this one. My office hours are the same. The only difference is you won't be able to come to campus and see me in my office. You can send me an email and talk with me that way. And there's rumors that we're going to get some sort of Cisco Jabber software so um, students can call us on the phone and then we get connected from home and things like that nature. Okay, boilerplate stuff. This is the same stuff we've had before. Uh, let me go to the part that's different here. Um, so the grading criteria in the in the bottom below this section of the ICR, it has the old the old grading scheme, but I've changed it to a different grading scheme here just to make it easier during this online session. So uh, the new grading scheme is going to be 50% of your grade will be the average of all the chapter exams and the final exam, all weighted equally. So there's there's a four, five, six, something like that. Uh, module and chapter exams and the final exam, and those will just be added all equally divided by the number, and that'll be 50% of your grade. Um, the other 50% will be the average of all the assigned laboratories, which I've listed. Let me move this down here where you can see. There's a few labs that are, that are in the study required. There will be no semester, this semester there will be no practical laboratory skills exam. So 50% of your grades will come from these labs that you do, and then 50% will come from the online chapter exams and the final, final exam. Um, the way I'm going to handle the laboratory uh, grading is um, please download from my TC Blackboard student lab printouts. I'm sorry, I'm seeing blasting the microphone here. Uh, please download that laboratory Microsoft Word documented format and uh, complete the few blanks. There's a few blanks in there. Most of the answers have been provided from the instructor version, but I put a few blanks in there. You know, I've got to check and see if you guys are reading this thing. And um, complete those and then save the document file, save as, and put your last name in all capital letters in the file name and just email that back to me at my mark.hicks at tccd.edu address or the william.hicks at my.tcc.edu address. Either one of those, I get it in the same inbox. And that's how we'll handle all that jazz. Okay, so this is the old stuff. Pay no attention to this. I have the old, what I intended to do here before we got the lockdown. But here's what we're going to do so far, and this is subject to change. Um, in the news today, Dallas County has already announced the lockdown. Only essential employees can go to work. I'm expecting that the Tarrant County, you guys that are watching on TV while you're having this, uh, let me predict the future. I'm going to predict that the Tarrant County judge and the mayor of Fort Worth and the mayor of Arlington are going to issue a shelter-in-place lockdown order, just like Dallas County has already done where we won't be able to leave unless we're going to the grocery store or something like that. So here's our assignment for today. It's our first uh, session. We're going over the class requirements. I'm going to cover the death by PowerPoint modules one and two for OSPF and um, mix in a little packet tracer here to show you some differences between the RIP that we've already covered and the new OSPF that we're covering now. Uh, when we meet again on Thursday morning at 9 o'clock, I'm going to cover uh, the module, ch chapter module three uh, security. Uh, uh, curriculum. Now I want to show the MyTCC Blackboard and show the little differences that I put in here. So let me find application window. Oh, I, I could have done I didn't have to do that. It was in another tab. I didn't have to stop sharing it and hide it. Okay, this is your MyTCC Blackboard. I know you guys already got to this because you have to come to this and click Blackboard Collaborate Ultra right here in order to be able to get into this teleconference that we're having right now. So I've got some of the same stuff I had here before. Um, I've added the Blackboard Collaborate feature and I've added the Recorded Presentations feature, which has got so far, I've got a couple of uh, useful videos from uh, Cisco guru David Bombal who uh, is instrumental in the GNS3 project and has a YouTube page with lots of 
good stuff on it. Um, he has got a great video on how to install and configure the packet tracer software program on a Windows machine, which is this first sli slide. And then he's, if you've got a Macintosh or a Hackintosh, uh, you want to install that Cisco recently released a Macintosh version. Uh, um, they also have a Linux version, and they also have a Android version. Uh, but I recommend the Windows version for best performance. So that's in the recorded presentations. After we finish today, uh, this presentation, which is being recorded, will appear in this section of recorded presentations as an MP4 file with a little, you know, postage stamp size video thing that you can click on or you can enlarge it to the entire size of the screen. Okay, now I want to uh, share the packet tracer program just briefly and show a couple of gotchas about this. Share it. Hide this. And in a second, it should pop up on your screen. Okay, there we go. A little latency there. And here is our packet tracer. When you start it up, it looks kind of like this. I've got it sort of reduced to fit into the Blackboard Collaborate uh, sharing video section. But uh, we're going to talk about OSPF. So let me do, a, I'll show, first of all, I want to show you a packet tracer gotcha. Uh, if you've never used packet tracer before, I'm going to put two routers in place. I'll go down here to the bottom section, and you notice the default is it's the first one is clicked, network devices. Later on, we'll click on a host and bring in a host maybe if our lab has that. And the first one is a router. If you want to choose a switch, you would click on a switch. I'm just going to pull in two routers. So I'm going to pick the 1941 router. And I'll put two of them in there. And then since those, those are so tiny, bigger. And you can drag them around and put them anywhere you want to. You can rename them. Uh, so here's the gotcha. When you look at a 1941 router, I'm going to just click on the router. And the screen pops up. I have to drag it back into our screen. And this shows a physical 1941 router, just like the ones we have in the back of the laboratory which you can't come use right now. Uh, this is a stock one. It doesn't have any serial ports in it. You guys that have been in my class before, remember all those dark blue serial cables that connected the labs together, S1 to S0 to S1 and so forth. So we need to add, I want to add for the purposes of this uh, uh, gotcha demonstration, how do you add, um, how do you add serial ports to this thing? Hang on one second, I'm going to check. Check attendance. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, we have seven out of 11. That's pretty good so far. Okay. Um, our 1941 routers have got a couple of option boards in them. Ours have got the WIC 2T 2 serial port option, and they've got the little miniature switch, the four port switch. I'm just going to use the 2T one here, but here's the picture of it. For example, here's the picture of the four port switch that ours has. I'm not going to use that right now. I want to add the serial port because I want to connect these two routers together using a serial cable. And if I try to add it there, it says, wah. I'll show you what the error message is. It came off the screen. Yeah, well, you're not supposed to add a piece of hardware like a printed circuit board, option board, to a device when it's actually turned on and still running. Well, okay, I'll buy that. So I'm going to go to the little power switch here and I'm going to turn it off. And then. I'm going to add the option board right in where we have ours on the right-hand side, and then I'll turn the power right back on again. And if you go to the CLI, you can actually see this starting to boot up like it normally would boot up. A packet tracer is a simulation software. Um, it's not like GNS3. It's not like um, uh, EVNG where it actually boots and runs the real iOS. It's kind of like uh, think of it as a macromedia flash simulation of the real world. It's pretty good. It has most commands that have been implemented. It's intended for CCNA students. So some CCNP commands and some CCI commands and some other weird commands don't work. They have not been implemented. If you use the GNS program or the EVNG program, those would all work properly because it's exactly the same code, warts and all, that you normally would see. It's like running when you run the VMware workstation software and you run a copy of Windows 7, or you run a copy of Windows 10, it's the actual same code. It responds exactly the same way. It mostly works. 
Okay, so I want to connect these two guys together to each other so we can do a little comparison here between RIP and OSPF, which we're going to cover in detail here in a minute in the PowerPoint slideshow. So I wanted to connect the serial ports together, so I had to add the serial ports to both devices. Did I add it to both of them? I don't think I added this one yet. Maybe I should add it to both of them. Okay, here's the other router. I need to add it to this, so I'm going to turn the power off. I'm going to click the Hotwick 2T. I'll drag it in, plug it in, and turn the power back on again. This is kind of cool here. You can't do this in GNS3. You can't do this in even G. And then um, if we go to the CLI, it should be booting up. It looks like it's booting up. Okay, everything's good. Now let's connect these two together. This uh, red jagged lightning bolt thing is all connections between devices. In your lab, you're going to connect two switches and two routers together. I'm going to do that later in Packet Tracer here after we cover the slideshow stuff. So I'm going to click on that, and I want to uh, – the, the, the if you can see at the bottom of the screen here uh, – I can't move it. It says copper straight-through cable. Um, we'll use that in the lab. But I'm going to simply use uh, uh, serial cables. So I'm going to click on serial cable. And then I'm going to click on the first device, and I'm going to connect serial port 000 of router 1 to serial port 001 of router 2. And now they should be connected OK. Now I'm going to test the connection. I'm going to go into the iOS of both devices and simply give them a host name and do a no shutdown on the serial port, and after a moment, this is my best practice recommendation anytime you do a lab. Give the labs their host names like R1, R2. Shut down any connected ports that you need in the lab. Wait a moment and then use the show CDP neighbors command to prove. Uh... Can you guys hear me okay? Can anybody else not hear me? Elijah's complaining he can't hear me. Can anybody else hear me? Casey says he can hear me. Ra uh, Lu uh, Luis says he can hear me. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. It's my fault entirely. Um, okay, people are generally reporting that they can hear. Elijah, you're the only one that's reporting that you can't hear me. So it sounds like the problem is not over here, but over there. As an option, Elijah, um, if you go back to uh, in the session, you'll see a telephone number you can call into, and you can call in with a voice telephone, and you might be able to hear the audio that way. Okay, pretty much everybody's reporting except Elijah. They can't hear me. I'm so sorry, Elijah, about that problem. Well, let's just continue as if everything was going really well. And I was going to uh, apply host names and shut down some serial ports, no shut down some serial ports, and see if we can get uh, uh, a proof that these guys are connected together at the data link layer. Because Cisco Discovery Protocol is a data link layer protocol. You don't actually need to apply IP addresses and ping them to prove it. You can do it more quickly than that. So I'm going to go to the first router, drag it onto the screen. I'm going to make this a little wider so that it doesn't wrap around all the characters. This looks like an erase router, so uh, I'll say no. We're switch. We'd have to check for the VLAN.dat file, but we don't have to do that. So I'll go to the privilege exec mode, and then I'll go to the global configuration mode, and then I'll give them a host name of R1. And then uh, the port that we're interested in, 0 slash 0 slash 0, I'm going to apply no shutdown command. And that's all I'm going to do. Then I'm going to do a similar thing over on router 2. So pull router 2 into your picture. Say no to the question. Go to the privilege exec mode. Go to the global configuration mode and give him a host name of R2. And then his interface was serial 0 slash 0 slash 1. And I'll perform the no shutdown command on that. As long as I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and apply the IP addresses that we are present in the assigned lab that you're going to do. Um, the second router, we're supposed to have an IP address of 10.53.0.2. In the lab, you won't be using serial ports. You're going to just be using Ethernet ports. But I use that address for consistency. I already did the no shutdown, correct? Show IP interface brief, and it looks like it's up and up. And then let's go back to the other router. 
and see if we can make these guys talk to each other. So we'll go back to router one, resize the screen for the for you guys. IP address of the first one was 10.53.0.1. Kind of a use for a point to point link that would normally be a, a, a slash 30. Already did that shutdown. So now if I do a show CDP neighbors, oh look, I can see R2 from R1. So I'm at R1 and R2 is being seen. Uh, my R1, R1's local 000 interface is connected to R2's 0001 interface. And we go and look at R2. We should see a similar thing, except that the numbers are going to be reversed. So when I do a show CDP neighbors on R2, I'm at R2. My neighbors being seen as R1. My R2 local sewer interface, S001, is connected to the other end at 0000. So this is a great feature of Cisco Discovery Protocol. It allows you to confirm that the plug A goes to plug, plug B at the right numeric value, and everything is cool. Um, OK, so when I do show IP interface brief, I was 10.53.0.2. So if I've got connectivity here, I should be able to ping 10.53.0.1. And it's good. It's working fine good. I'm getting the dots, the exclamations. If it were bad, it would get the dot, 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 dot. And when you do this lab later on the Ethernet ports, Ethernet ports connected via the two switches, your first thing or two will fail because of the ARP process lining up the data link layer address with the IP address. Now I'm going to put in these uh, loopback ports that are present. R2 has the following loopback port uh, specified. I'll go to the configuration mode and put in interface uh, loopback. He says use loopback one. That's fine. Now loopback ports are don't have to be shut down because they are they they are born activated. You can shut them down later if you want to and do no shutdown, but we should not have to shut them down. They'll be up and up. And the IP address in this lab is given as 192.168.1.1 with a slash 24. Oh, is it up and up? Show IP interface brief. Ah, loopback is up and up. And the serial port is up and up. Now let's go to router R1 and add his loopback. Okay, show, I'm sorry, I'm abbreviating show IP interface brief. I should do tap completion to make the command perfectly clear. And we're going to add the, uh, let's see, can I ping 10.53.0.2? That's okay. Okay, we need to add this uh, loopback port to um, R1. So I'll go to configuration mode, interface, loopback one. IP address 172.16.1.1 and your normal 255.255.255.0. So if I do show IP interface brief, it works. Let me see. Does the, how about my command? Show um, protocols. Does that work? It actually works too. I like show protocols as an alternative to show IP interface brief. Because show IP interface brief does not show you your subnet mask. Uh, show protocols shows you this, the slash 24. So you can check IP, you check for incorrect subnet masks by using that scheme. Okay, now I was able to ping across from our router R1. Let me go back to router R1. I was able to ping the uh, a serial port across the link that was um, 10.53.0.2. That was okay. And let me see, can I ping the loopback port 192.168.1.1? And I cannot ping it. I'm getting the dots. 
why can I not ping that? Well, let's investigate and see why. Routers receive a packet and the first thing they do is look in their routing table and see if he has a route to that. Um, there is no static route. Gateway of last resort has not been set. There's no default static route. So Cisco routers automatically uh, will, will be able to route between their directly connected interfaces. So if that 172.16 was a host machine, a PC, he would be able to ping the serial port just fine, but he's not able to ping the simulated host machine, that loopback port on router R2, because there's no information in this routing table. He has the 10 dot network. He has his directly connected loopback port, but he has no information at all about that 192.168 port. So we need to put that in there somehow. Um, so the classical method to do this in the real world we use a little bit of static routing. We like to put in a default static route from the branch office back to the home office. Or we'd like to put in a default static route from the, from the home corporation office to the ISP so our people can get on the internet. But we don't want those 750,000 routes of the internet in our routing tables because our routers aren't big and powerful like that. Um, so we normally would run a dynamic routing, routing protocol within our enterprise. So I'm going to do one we've already used before. You should remember this one. I'm going to go to the configure mode and go router rip. And then we're going to tell our directly attached networks that are connected to this router. Oh, I should probably put version two because we've got some difference. Well, we have the same subnet mask in there, but we have three different classes of network. We have our 10 dot class A, we have our 172 class B, we have our 192 class C. So just to be sure, I'm going to put version two on there. The other advantages of version two was it multicast his entire routing table to his neighbor every 30 seconds instead of broadcasting. Allows the LSM, allows uh, classes and domain routing, and some other things that the old original RIP couldn't do. So what are our directly attached networks here? The, the, what you do with RIP is you give him the names of your directly attached networks, the classful names of your directly attached networks. So we have the network 10.0.0, .0, and we have the network 1.0. 72.16.0.0. Now I'll go to the other router. Let's see if I can. Okay, I'll just do this. Let's go to the other router and put the rip on him and see what happens. And see if these guys can communicate to each other and we can ping the loopback ports. It may take a minute for them to update themselves. So if I do show IP route, so we started rip on router R1. R2 doesn't have the rip procedure in him yet. He cannot receive the information. We need to turn on RIP on the router R2 and add uh, the directly attached network so they can share them with each other. OK, so configure mode, router RIP version 2. And the directly attached networks on router R2 was the 10 dot network and the 192.168.1 network. So now if we type show IP protocols on this router, we are running the RIP process. We are running networks 10 to 162. Um, and it may take a minute for them to exchange information with each other. But if I do a show IP route command on this router, oh, he has learned his neighbor's information. The 172.16 is the loopback network attached to that loopback port on router R1. Um, that's not directly connected to him. So in theory here, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, practice and theory sometimes differ. But I should be able to ping that loopback port on R1, which was 172.16.1.1. It works. OK. And let's go back and check R1, make sure these. Remember the Zen of routing. If there's one path there and another path back, they should be able to talk back to each other. Each router operates independently based upon what's in his routing table. Only he can share information with the others. But if they're not updated, if the network's not converged, there won't be any proper communication. So show IP route. And here is our listing from router R1's perspective. This is a remote RIP advertised network 192.168.1. And let's see if we can ping that. 192.168. 1.1, it pings. OK, so we have full connectivity in this network, and we haven't put in any static routes. Um, 
Okay, now I haven't talked about the theory and operation of OSPS, OSPF yet, but we have done RIP before. Let's do OSPF and see how it's almost the same. The configuration is mostly the same. The theory and operation is going to be more complicated. Um, now, looking at this, looking at this routing table, here's our RIP, uh, uh, RIP route we learned from the other router, and the first number in the brackets is the thing called the administrative distance. That's the uh, that's like the Boy Scout oath: trustworthy, reliable, uh, friendly, obedient. Uh, uh, it's 120, and like metrics, the lower is better. So it's one hop away. The two routers are each one hop away from each other. So I'm going to add the OSPF routing protocol, and let's see what this changes if we still have connectivity and see what happened to the RIP. Okay, so I'm going to go to the configuration mode. I'm going to say router OSPF, and you have to put a number, and a number doesn't matter. They can be the different on different routers. I just always use one. Now I'm going to use my this is a this is a Hicks hack. Um, it's an alternative to typing in the network addresses and OSPF. You're supposed to use uh, wildcard masks. So uh, let's not spin that right now. Uh, I'm a, instead I'm going to just use a uh, quick and dirty method. I'm going to say network 0.0.0.0 which means any network that's located on this router that's directly connected at all with any subnet mask or wildcard mask. Area zero, we'll talk about the concept of area zero when we talk about the OSPF theory and operation. And then I'll do the same thing on the other router and let's see what changes when we do this. So I'll go to the first router again. Okay, back to configure terminal, router OSPF. And just to prove it, I'm going to use two instead of one because they don't have to be the same. The number that has to be the same is the area number. All OSPF networks must start with a, a core area, a backbone area called area zero. Oops. What happened here? Let's see. Um, oh, I misspelled it. Router OSPF two. They only do what you tell them to, not let them to. I misspelled it. My Is that my first misspelling for the day? I usually have lots and lots. Okay, network. Four out, quad zero, area zero. This number must match. If I put area one on this one, and I put area zero on another one, we would not have any connectivity. The two guys would decide they're in different networks, and they hadn't been summarized in each other, and they would not talk back and forth. Okay, I'm going to wait a second here. Normally, OSPF, EIGRP is kind of the same way, but EIGRP is kind of gone now. Uh, they should be able to achieve convergence with each other in no time at all. Now, I'm going to type that command, show IP protocols, and you can see that we're using the RIP process. It's still there. I didn't turn it off. RIP version 2 for these directly attached networks. And then for OSPF, did I do this on both routers? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Did I make a terrible mistake here? Hold on. I think I may have done this accidentally on both devices. Uh, let me see. Uh, show. Run. What did I do? I think I configured it on both devices at the same time. Let's see. Oh, I did, I did it on both of them at the same one time here by mistake. Okay, I need to take away the two on this one. Okay, so I'm making lots of mistakes. Good for me. Okay, configure my own. Uh, no router OSPF2. And we're on router zero, which is the first one right now. Okay. So I'm gonna let me go to router two here. Show IP protocol. And it just has rip. So, uh, I lost my mind there for a second, but I'm okay now. So we'll go to configure mode, and we'll say router OSPF2, because I want to illustrate that the process number doesn't make any difference, and then network quad zero. Area zero must match exactly. Now, show IP protocol is showing that the RIP is still active and that the OSPF is active. 
and it may give a moment for this to take place. And normally on real equipment, you see a little message as they, uh, let me see if I can show IP uh, OSPF neighbor. I'm not getting his neighbor yet. And it normally takes about a minute in a real device. So I predict right now that if I look at the IP route routing table, there's going to be no change in here. Uh, show CDP neighbor. Are we still talking? Looks like we're still talking. And let me go to router two and see what he's doing. Oh, I was at router two. This is router one. Nothing confusing about this. There is an ability in Packet Tracer to change the numbers on this on the diagram too as well. Okay, so if I do a show show IP protocols, we're running RIP and we're running OSPF one. And if we do show IP OSPF neighbor, he's still not well, we'll give that a minute to do that to do that. It normally takes a while. This should work okay in the packet tracer. I don't know. Maybe I made a mistake. What we're going to see here, though, eventually is that um, the administrative distance for OSPF is 110. Metrics are like 50-yard like, uh, dash numbers. The lowest is the better. So eventually, the metric of 110 will say, I am better than RIP's metric of 120. And the RIP entries will be removed from the routing table and it will be replaced with the O for OSPF entry for those. So well, I'm not, well, not going to hang Larry and wait for this. We've got a bunch of slides to go through here. So I'm going to just click to the slides and um, five, six, seven, who we got here that I missed. Ah, okay, good. We have mostly, mostly people in attendance here. Okay, so I'm going to temporarily stop sharing the screen. We'll wait for it to come up later. And I'm going to go and share some files. And uh, death by PowerPoint. Share now. And in the second now, it's going to show up on the screen. Oh, come on, show it. Select a slide to begin sharing. Oh, okay, here we go. I have to click this. That was pretty quick. Okay, testing the moving of the slides back and forth. I can't click my arrow key. I guess I gotta, I gotta click this thing. Come back. Okay, so he's talking about OSPF. RIP was a distance vector routing protocol. It only sent its metric of one hop, two hops, three hops, in what direction? And it's a very hazy neighborly view of the network. OSPF is a link state routing protocol. There's uh, really only two we're concerned about with OSPF and the unfortunately named intermediate system to intermediate system, ISIS, or ISIS uh, which is a CCMP topic. Um, it uh, has uh, sends a complete topology map it has a method of flooding the complete topology map of all of the routers within an OSPF area. So they don't have this hazy neighborly view. Uh, it's, it's like instead of RIP is like going to a gas station and asking for directions. And OSPF is like having a GPS, having a navigation unit, having a roadmap, having a map scope. You know exactly where you're going. No loops. The area concept is if we have a very, OSPF scales up very well. RIP is great for smaller companies. Easy to configure, easy to understand. RIP is a little more complex, but if it's a large complex organization, you can divide the different branch offices and companies into areas, which optimizes and reduces the, uh, the network traffic between the OSPF routing protocol. So I know that we used to use EIGRP. Tarrant County College used to use EIGRP. And I think about five years ago, we switched to OSPF. So South Campus is one area, the central, Downtown campus is probably area zero, and uh, this way it, uh, uh, well, we're not going to do multi-area OSPF. We used to do this in CCNA. However, in CCNA now, we used to do multi-area, and we used to do IP version 6. But right now, the only required OSPF configuration knowledge for the new CCNA curriculum is, uh, objective is 
single area OSPF for IP version 4 only. So it's slightly easier. Okay, when RIP routers started talking to each other, they would um, send their entire routing table to their neighbor every 30 seconds. They didn't have a special hello packet. Uh, OSPF has a special hello packet, a very lightweight compact packet that he uses to discover his neighbors and maintain the adjacency and neighborship with his neighbors. And they've got some packets that, that are used to flood the topology to the entire rest of the network and then are used uh, to update individual routers back and forth as to the links links that they know that. When I say a link, I talk about like a point-to-point -point serial link or Ethernet plug between one router and another router. And this is how they discover their neighbors and talk to each other. Okay, so there are three tables in OSPF. In RIP, there was only one table, the routing table. In OSPF, there are three tables. The adjacency table is the neighbors. Uh, this is the list of the directly connect neighbors. Remember, I typed, showed, type in that command, show IP OSPF interface, and uh, show IP OSPF neighbor. That would show your directly uh, connected neighbor. When OSPF routers start up, they go through a process of flooding their little, think of a jigsaw puzzle, where there's a jigsaw puzzle with 12 pieces, like 12 routers in a, neighbor, in a corporate topology. Each router knows a whole bunch about its own directly connected network networks. For example, when you do show IP route and there's no routing protocols, the router already knows about his directly connected neighbors or his directly connected interfaces, and he puts those in a routing table. Uh, this little information about this particular one router in this little jigsaw puzzle piece is flooded out to all the other routers, and there's a brief flurry of traffic while all the routers flood their jigsaw puzzle pieces to all the others. And then there's a brief flurry and flood of CPU activity on each router as they assemble the jigsaw puzzle piece, and they all end up with the same map, the same topology, the same map scope, the same GPS. And then they individually figure where they are in the puzzle to all the others and calculate the best path in a very similar fashion to what we saw with spanning tree protocol by using this cost method. Same numbers even. The 19 is the cost for a 100 megabit Ethernet link. Once each router has got the complete database and he figures his best path everywhere else, he puts, he puts the answer in the forwarding database. And then it's uh, forwarding database is uh, now, we have now have convergence and all the routers can be able to see each other. You can type show IP route to see all the other OSPF routers in the network. You'll be able to communicate ping with them. Okay, so here, see, I sort of went through this already briefly. Um, um, the routers build their topology table by by um, using the shortest path first algorithm, same exact algorithm used in uh, spanning tree protocol, and they calculate the shortest path to each node. Then the best results are put in the forwarding database, which is what we call our routing table. Okay, so to make this take place, some things have to happen first. First of all, each router has to deter determine if he is uh, adjacent with another router. So we had to configure all the routers with the OSPF area zero, all the same area. Everything in right now is area zero, IP version four only for CCNA. Then once they find out who their neighbors are, they send them their piece of the jigsaw puzzle, their link state advertisements for their directly connected networks flooded to all the other 11 routers in my example topology. Then each router independently builds the link state database, all identical on all 12 routers, just like uh, uh, delivery drivers in Dallas and Fort Worth all carry the exact same map scope. They may be, one may be in Fort Worth, one may be in Dallas, but they have the exact same database. Then each independently figures the best route to every other point in the network and punches those results into the routing table for that particular device. So in a single OSPF area, all routers are in one area and we should use area zero. So all the stuff we're gonna do right now for CCNA is single area OSPF only. Uh, when you get to the CCNP and advanced routing stuff, they will cover multi multiple, multiple area, multi-area OSPF. 
but we're going to just use single area OSPF version two, which means for IP version four. Uh, if you're running IP version six, you would use OSPF version three to cover that, but we don't have to worry about that for the purpose of the regular CCNA. This is a good reason for this. Here's a typical multi-area OSPF router. And let's say area zero was the downtown district campus. And area one is here we are at South Campus. And then area 51, and this is, it's required by law if you teach OSPF to always put it in area 51 because of the joke about the New Mexico flying saucer thing. It can be any numbers you want to. You must start with area zero, but all the other numbers can be any numbers you want. Well, it's a 16-bit value, any number up to 65,000. So everybody always puts it in area 51 just to show how clever they are. So if I had a multiple area, the flooding of the protocols, the flooding of the link state advertisements only occur within this area. The flooding for the stuff here at South Campus will only occur within this area. This reduces the flooding and reduces the calculation of each router as you have to calculate the routing tables. Between area one and area zero, we're gonna summarize. Between area zero and area 51, we're gonna summarize. Manually summarized. So this improves the performance of the entire network. Um, the general consensus in the field is if you have a, uh, a large, really large complex site with over 200 sites, OSPF is the best way to go. If you have fewer than that, you could use OSPF, you could use EIGRP. If you have a fairly simple site, you could use RIP. Okay, OSPF version three is for IP version six. Um, so there is a, oh, he has a thing about the redress families feature that is not present in our routers. So we don't have to worry about that. That's beyond the scope, that's CCNP. Uh, OSPF version three is exactly the same, pretty much nearly as OSPF version two, but it's if you're using IP version six. So if you were running dual stack, which is best practice now, you'll run your old OSPF for your IP version four addresses, and you can run your OSPF version three for your IPv6 addresses at the same time. If you want to see the version two routing table, you'll type uh, IP version four routing table, you just type show IP route. If you want to see the IP version six, you type show IPv6 route. We've already seen that. So it's like running um, Word and Excel on a Windows machine. You could run two processes concurrently on one device. Okay, OSPF packets. We talked about the packet. The hello packet is the packet that discovers the neighbors, builds this neighborhood, neighborship, relationship adjacency between them. And they're sent at periodic intervals. So if I was using RIP, I would send my entire routing table every 30 seconds. And that's how my neighbor router would know I'm still alive. That's kind of inefficient because I'm sending the entire routing table, maybe even broadcasting it every 30 seconds. So with OSPF, and EIG up here is kind of similar, we're gonna send it at maybe a five second, 10 second interval, something like that, just to know that he doesn't have to send me all of his information. Just, hey, I'm still here, hello. When the routers first start talking to each other, they send database description files to see generally if they have the same information. Then if they need more specific information, they can send a link state request and receive a link state update. And it, except their hello packets, these are acknowledged. Think of TCP, sync, act, sync, sync, act, act, send the first, segment, acknowledge, get the sense segment. We acknowledge, we acknowledge this important information. Hello packets are not acknowledged because they just come every five or 10 seconds. Uh, if I miss one, I hope the other one will come in another 10 seconds. That would create too much traffic. So the link state updates are used to forward the routing updates. Um, there's different types of link state advertisements and these contain the various information. like, is it a local route? Is it a link, et cetera. So the type one hello packet is the one used for discovering neighbors and establishing adjacencies with the neighbors. Um, there are a couple of things that must match between the two routers before they can become neighbors. The area number must be the same. The IP subnet mask and IP network must be the same. The wiring connector type on both routers must be the same. And this is our first mention of something called the designated router and backup designated router. This is similar to the concept in spanning tree protocol of the root bridge or the root switch. This is a boss 
router whose job is to be a central reference point for all of the other routers in a single multi-access Ethernet type network. Not required on a point-to-point -point link, like a serial port, a direct point-to-point -point serial link. More on that later, I think. Oh, we have a video. Well, we're going to have that video. I'm going to talk about this. So um, when the routers first come up, they're in the down state. And when you type router OSPF1 and attach the networks, they'll start sending hello packets out on all of the interfaces that are on the up and up state on that router that are members of any of those networks. And we'll go from the down state to the init initiation state. When we jump to the init state, we hear a hello packet from our neighbor and it matches enough. It's the same subnet mask. It's the same network, uh, comes from the same network bank of addresses. Uh, the hello and the, uh, the hello packet time matches and we'll go to the two-way state. And then we'll go to the two-way state. And if it's a serial point-to-point, -point, we can now we're ready to talk to each other and send packets back and forth. If it's on a multi-access Ethernet network, like you're going to do in your lab, the routers will elect the designated router and backup designated router based upon uh, actual real IP addresses, not preferred, loopback ports, better, or the router ID designation, which is the best practice these days. So on a EX start state on a point-to-point -point networks, they sort of have a casual master-slave relationship, not a designated router, backup designated router. And they exchange packets, database packets with each other so that they can populate their routing tables. And then eventually they'll go to the full state where they can talk back and forth with each other. <clears throat> I have a presentation in the PowerPoint presentations thing uh, called, what is it called here? Let me go over here and refresh my memory of what it's called that has excellent uh, PowerPoint graphics. It's called, uh, it's called uh, Cool OSPF Graphics. And if you turn on the feature in your PowerPoint, you guys know that you can get PowerPoint Microsoft Office free. Go to Blackboard homepage, you can get it if you need it. Uh, if you turn on the thing that allows macros, which is normally considered dangerous, uh, it has cool IP OSPF graphics that shows this process of going through the down state, the init state, and so forth as the routers become fully adjacent with each other. So the router sends out hello packet, looks for the neighbors. This is a multicast thing on IP version 4. Multicasting is kinder and gentler than broadcasting like the old RIP 1. RIP 2 went to multicasting, so it wasn't so, uh, didn't slow down everybody's desktop PCs. The router ID is a 32-bit number, and it's going to be either the highest numbered physical IP address on that router, or preferably at least a loopback port, which can never go down or the router ID command. And uh, when uh, a router receives hello packets with others, he puts them in his neighbor list and they attempt to flood the topology to each other and get the network first. So on this chart, I've already covered this stuff. We go through the process of the NIT state, the two-way state. Uh, uh, if it's a multi-access Ethernet network, we have to elect the designated router and backup designated router based upon those IP addresses or loopback ports. And so uh, uh, in a two-way state, send their databases back and forth and synchronize them. And after that's happened, now in RIP, the entire routing table is sent to this neighbor every 30 seconds over and over and over again, even if nothing changes. That's inefficient and wastes bandwidth. In OSPF, EIGRP sort of does this too. Uh, they only send a change when a change occurs. Or there's something called the paranoid update. Every 30 minutes, they do a complete flooding one more time just to make sure that nothing got missed. So the reason we have to use a designated router and a backup designated router is if we did not do this, and this information was flooded from this router to this router, this router to this router, this router, this router, this router, and then all the routers repeating that, that's a lot of connections. So instead, let's let let's let's have one router be the master point. Every one of the other four routers will send their topology information to the master router, the designated router, and then he will only send out one copy to the others. That preserves network bandwidth. So if we didn't use the designated router backup designated router method, it would create a lot of extra traffic. 
the backup designated router, since it's certain an important function, is elected at the same time that the designated router is. And if the designated router stops acting for more than one second, the backup designated router will uh, take over and make sure the process continues. Oh, we're not doing that. Oh, good. Now we can go to the next slideshow and it looks like the actual configuration. Okay, share now. Okay. Okay, OSPF router ID. How does each OSPF process determine his router ID? So we have a topology here where we have some loopback ports and we have some physical ports. And let's see what's going to happen here. Um, to configure the router, we go into the global configuration mode and say router OSPF and make up a number. And again, it can be any number we want. It has no, they don't have to be the same on all the routers. It'll work just fine. Um, the router ID is a 32-bit value. And even if you're going to go to CCNP and do OSPF version 2 or OSPF version 3 for IP version 6, it still needs a 32-bit uh, router ID value. So this uniquely identifies each router. Okay, so um, the router ID is used to identify the different routers and figure out which one is going to become the master router or the designated router. So the best method is use the router ID command. If I do that, when I first started teaching CCNA 20 years ago, we didn't have the router ID command. We had to use loopbacks. But the router ID command is better because it can't be changed. You set it and it stays the same. That's the currently recommended best practice for designating the router ID of a. To do that, what happens? If you fail to use that command, router ID, it looks for any loopback ports that are present on that router. Loopback ports are at least slightly not quite as bad as only using physical ports because loopback ports normally don't go down. A physical port attached to a serial port going to a T1 line could go down. A phone company could go down. And then that would be uh, not the right router ID for that guy anymore. So we used to use the loopback port. If you fail to do the router ID command, and if you fail to create any loopback ports, the router has no choice but to find the highest active IP address on any of its ports in that moment in time to determine the uh, router ID for that. So here's what I did on the packet register program. I went to interface loopback one, I created an address, and uh, that became the loopback value. And so that way I don't have to rely upon a physical interface, which, which could go up or down, the wire might come unplugged, and uh, that way it would be the router ID for this. So in the example topology in the slideshow, he's just seen three routers, and he's made the first router 1.1.1.1, and the second router is all twos, and the second router is all threes. So that sets the router ID, and that's, that's more reliable than counting on a physical interface, which could go up and down. We can change the router ID. Um, if we want to do this, we're allowed to change the router ID. We could change it to another value, but if we do that, we would have to copy, run, start, and reload the router. Or you can type the command clear IP OSPF process and clear it. That works on some routers. If that doesn't work, you would have to actually make sure you do a copy, run, start, reload the router, wait three minutes for that to, to take place. OK, point-to-point -point networks is what I set it up in the packet tracer. On a point-to-point -point network, um, I can configure. And use, I use the network command. That's the old method of using the network command. I said network 10.53. Uh, I use the wildcard. I use the 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0. .0. You can compare the network commands, and then you would use the wildcard mask like we did with access control lists instead of the actual uh, subnet mask. So 255.255.255.0, the wildcard mask equivalent would be 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.255. Now, some of the older iOSs will allow you to type in the actual subnet mask, and he will convert it to the wildcard mask area for you. Don't count on that being in every version. Go to the next slide. So the normal calculation method for going back and forth between 
subnet mask and wildcard mask is subtract it from 255.255.255.255 and that will give you the wildcard mask and there's an error in the slide here in the numeric values okay so here's what we could do we could say router ospf arbitrary number and put in our directly attached networks and those would be uh, part of the ospf process as an alternative, I can specify an exact quad zero, and that would enable a particular interface that you've set up for this. So that's a little bit more convenient than calculating wildcard masks. So I could configure it also directly. This is a weird thing that we actually have to do in IP version six all the time. In IP version four, as an alternative, instead of using the network commands under the router config router prompt, you can go to the interface and say IP OSPF 10, matches area, uh, process 10, area zero, and that way you don't have to calculate any numbers at all. So that's a slightly easier method that's in the newer iOSs. Uh, almost every routing protocol has this feature, RIP, OSPF, EIGRP. What about that Ethernet interface that network doesn't go to any other routers, but only goes to your employees' workstations? And they're sending out all these hello messages and flooding all these topology messages out. Uh, well, I could just not put their network name in the list of networks, but then no one will be able to reach them. So that's no good. Instead, what I can do is go ahead and do my network statements like I normally would, but find that interface, that Ethernet interface that goes to a room full of employees and never goes to any other routers, and specify that to be a passive interface. That way, he has full connectivity with the other OSPF devices. But we won't hear those PCs, those employee PCs won't hear any of that stuff. This was really a problem back in the old days of RIP, which broadcasted every 30 seconds. It would slow down the employees' PCs. Uh, RIP version 2 multicasted got better. But this way, they don't have to listen. The PCs don't have to listen to anything. They don't have to decode any broadcast or multicast messages and slow down the important work that the employees are doing to increase the company. So we can use this by saying, he's saying a passive interface, a loopback zero, which is a bad example. It would probably be an Ethernet port. And then no hello messages will be sent out, in and out that port because there's no other routers out that port that he needs to connect to. And that would slightly increase the, uh, reduce the bandwidth and increase the CPU cycles actually available to the machine. Now, if it's an Ethernet based network, and there's only two of them. Or as however many there are, there could be quite a few of them. Uh, we need to elect a DR and ba ba designated router and backup designated router. So ESP, uh, Ethernet is a multi-access network. Uh, there, are, there is an old technology called frame relay that's multi-access on least telephone lines. That's considered multi-access and we would elect a designated router on that as well. Not too much frame really present in the United States anymore. Most people have gone to Ethernet handoff, but in South America and some other places, they still use a lot of frame really. But if it's a point-to-point -point network, like I set up the two serial ports in Packet Tracer, I set up a point-to-point -point network, and they don't have to, they will not create a designated router and backup designated router because on the point-to-point -point network, there's only two devices. There's just you and me. I think everybody in the world has gone crazy, but you and me, and I'm again, I have my doubts about you, is how the routers think. So we can set it up in that fashion instead. They won't set up a designated router. If I want to change it to a point-to-point -point network, they're gonna have you do this in the lab. You're gonna attach your two routers together, R1 and R2 via ethernet through two switches. And then you're gonna say, make them a point-to-point -point network. Now that doesn't work in Packet Tracer, unfortunately, you have to have real machines. If you're using GNS or even G, you can do this. Uh, Packet Tracer, I don't think has implemented this product this process. So that way, by making it a point-to-point -point network, we don't have to go through the whole designated router, backup designated router election process. We'll see how that works out. Okay, um, loopbacks are our use, well, the biggest use of loopbacks years ago was before we had the router ID command, we used the loopback command to set the router ID for the router. They're useful for if you have a router that you ran out of ethernet ports and you wanna make a simulated ISP or simulated web server, you can simply create a loopback port. And then you can change it to a point-to-point -point port so it doesn't uh, consume more devices. Okay, in multi-access based networks, uh, multi-access based networks, we have four routers here connected to a common ethernet switch. It could be a hub, works just the same. 
which one of these should be the designated router, the boss router, for all of these uh, to share their topology information with each other? Because we want to have a bunch of, of virtual point-to-point -point links. So in a multi-access based network, it's going to be a function of their router, router ID, which was determined either by the router ID command or failing that by the loopback port or failing that by the highest physical port that just happens to be up at this moment. So the direct designated router collects all the link state advertisements. He sends them out to all the others using this special multicast address. It's such an important function that a backup is elected. He listens in the background. He maintains the same databases. If the DR stops working, which mean, it means he doesn't send out hello packets anymore, the BDR will promote himself and assume the role of the designated router and stay that way even if the original designated router comes back online. All other routers are a druther. They're not a designated router. They're not a backup designated router. They're a druther router. If I had my druthers, I'd rather be the designated router, but my IP address was wrong, so I didn't get to use one. And they use multi-access, multi multi-access, uh, uh, multicast address. That's this wrong. This is multi-access. Should say multicast address of 224.0.0.6 to send back and forth to the designated router. And silently in the background, the backup designated router is hanging in the background, waiting for a palace coup so he can take over and become this. So in this topology here, which one should become the designated router? Well, it's going to be the function of the router ID. Uh, it looks as if there are no loopback ports in here or here or here. So someone must have typed the router ID command and set the router ID. And this is typically done in the Cisco Network and Academy Labs. R1 would have a router ID of all ones. Router 3, all 3s. Router 2, all 2s. So which one should become, when they start sending their hello packets back and forth and they establish their adjacencies, next step is elect the DRBDR. Which one is going to become the designated router? Well, he's got the highest address. He becomes the designated router. Two has got the next highest address. He becomes the backup designated router. And what's this one called? The druther. He's just a normal router. He's not a backup or primary uh, designated router. I like to compare this to in Microsoft networks and Microsoft Active Directory networks. We've got Primary domain controllers and backup domain controllers. Well, that's what they used to call them. Now they're called domain controllers or replica domain controllers. But the job of checking your password is so important that we have to give it to more than one server because one server might just crash. We can check these. We can type the command show IP OSPF interface and specify the gigabit port number. You're going to be using G001 in your lab instead of G, G, G01 instead of G001. Oh, caveat in the lab. It assumes you got the newer 4000 router, and it says G001. You will type G01 if you use the 1941 router at Packet Tracer. You do actually have the choice in Packet Tracer of pulling up the 4000 series routers and getting the interface port numbering scheme that they use in that. So this tells you it's up and up, what the IP address is. And he tells you that this particular one, R1, he wasn't a backup designated router or a designated router. He was a druther. He was neither one of these. And this tells you, this statement tells you that this, this one checks for that. <clears throat> so uh, router 2 is the backup designated router because he had the second highest address. Router 3 is the designated router. And router 2, the man in the middle, has two adjacencies, the one to the left and the one to the right. So you can see those as directly attached neighbors. And the route output generated by R3 also confirms all these features as well. OK, if I type show IP OSPF command, it will show me the state of my neighbors, not me, just my neighbors. So for example, if we did this in router R1, he wasn't a good enough number to be the designated backup designated router. Router 1 would see Router 2. He wouldn't see R3 because it's not directly attached neighbor to him. If we typed it from R2, he would see his neighbors on the left and the right, and he would say, well, this one's the DR, this one's the Druther. So if it's not in the full state, something's wrong. IP addresses don't match. Something's going on that needs to be troubleshot. So here, R2, the man in the middle, show IP OSPF neighbor. His, his router three is the master router, the designated router. His router 
uh, neighbor router on the left, R1, with the lowest, worst possible number. He's in the full state, but he's just a druther. We want to be in the full state with each other. Uh, it's normal for it to take one or two minutes on real equipment to go through this down, init, uh, flooding the information, calculating, and then going to the full state and figuring out who's going to be the designated router if it's Ethernet attached devices. So here's the steps that go take place. Number one, the routers are going to determine their adjacencies with the other routers, and then they're going to go through the process. Before they can flood their topology, if it's a multi-access network, we have to determine the designated router because he's going to collect and distribute all the jigsaw puzzle pieces. So, oh, this is a gotcha. No fair. We haven't talked about this yet. There's another method of overruling something called interface priority. I can configure an interface with an interface priority. And the one with the desert highest number becomes the DR, and the other one becomes the BDR. So a number that defaults, one. If I make it zero, it will never even think about becoming a designated router. Uh, if I set it to any other value, the highest number wins. If that has not been configured, then we're going to use the highest router ID value. The router with the second highest becomes the backup designated router. If we haven't even done that, the highest loopback port will determine. If we haven't done even in that, he is forced to fall back onto his last ditch, which is what is the highest physical IP address present on that individual router of any of the any of the interfaces present on that router, even if some of the interfaces are not part of this particular multi-access network, like a serial port. So if I bring in a new router, he doesn't take over. This is not like STP. If I bring in a new bridge, if I bring in a new switch to STP, to uh, switches, and has a lower MAC address, it takes over. In OSPF, that doesn't take place. I would have to reboot all the routers, or an easier method is simply unplug Unplug the three wire, wires going to the common Ethernet switch, wait two minutes from the timeout, and plug them back in, and then they'll form a new election. Easier than typing copy run start and booting them all up again. Okay, after a DR is selected, he will remain the DR unless he fails, or he crashes, or the multi-access interface gets pulled or fails for some reason. At this point, the BDR automatically is promoted to DR and stays that way. However, He's going to immediately elect a new BDR to take his place. So um, then nothing will change again in the future until the DR, this DR has a problem and he stops becoming the DR. The ISPF priority command, IPOSPF priority command, is by default one. If I make it zero, this is on a particular interface like config T, interface gigabit Ethernet. Uh, this is uh, overrules all other numbers. This is the top priority. If I make it a number, he'll use that to determine whether it becomes a DRBDR on that particular multi-access network that that Ethernet port of that router is connected to all the Ethernet ports of the other routers, probably through an Ethernet switch. So we can configure this by, uh, in this case, he's gone to the Ethernet port and he's made it a priority of 255, which is top priority. Then he's typed clear IPOSPF process, and that will, on most routers, usually reset the process and make it start again. You would have to do that on all the other routers as well at the same time. Then we get a new one. Okay, back when the OSPF was introduced, there were not gigabit Ethernets. Fast Ethernet was just on the horizon. So they came up with a cost method. This cost method is because a metric that's lower is better. We have to somehow, if it was just a pure bandwidth command, fast Ethernet is 100 million bits per second. Uh, regular standard Ethernet is 10 million bits per second, but 10 million is lower than 100 million. That's a better choice? No. So we have to put it in the bottom of the fraction. So we put the actual interface in the bottom of the fraction, and we put a number on the top of 100 million, and that gives us a cost metric that actually becomes a lower number when the speed gets faster because faster speed is more desirable. So there's some, some methods in here where we can change this reference bandwidth if we're using, oh, maybe we're uh, a new San Francisco technology company and we're using 40 megabit and 25 megabit and 100 megabit Ethernet stuff. So we can change these reference values if we want to. 
So uh, standard 10 megabit, the cost would go down because it would be divided. But as it gets to lower cost, due to reference bandwidth being the higher value, um, this wouldn't have worked 20 years ago because when we Ethernet, the fast Ethernet, we wanted to differentiate between them. But these days, we're using gigabit, 10 gigabit Ethernet between our different devices. So it's got to be a value, you know, a power of 10 is a good thing to use. We can change this if we want to. Uh, warning, Will Robinson, if you change this on one router, you have to change this on all the other routers to match it. Uh, I would count on whatever OSPF you're using being the, uh, or rather whether uh, iOS you're using on your device, make sure the iOS devices are all updated and simply use the defaults. It'll work fine. And I'm going to skip this and go to the... When we talked about spanning tree protocol, they would accumulate the cost. Like if these were switches, it would say 18, uh, 19 plus 19 is 38 this way. 19 this way is faster. I'm going to use this. It's going to be my uh, designated port and my root port. So OSPF operates in a very similar fashion. It accumulates the costs. So if the cost between router R1 and R2, the cost is 10. That's a metric of 10. If I could go this way, that would be 10 plus 20. Well, that's a backup route maybe, but I'm not going to use that if I can use this one better. If this link went down, now this is now the better cost. I could go around the other way. So he accumulates it in much the same fashion that Spanish Tree Protocol did. So you can type the show IP route command and see what the actual cost is that he has accumulated to any other remote networks here. So in this case, he's done show IP route and include this particular network, and he has cost of 11 that he's calculated. The 110, that's the administrative distance. What was it for RIP? It was 120. So if we have RIP and OSPF running on the same router at the same time, you normally would never do that. You'd use one routing protocol. Uh, then OSPF would supersede RIP, and the OSPF entries would appear in the routing table and, and not in the other one. We can manually override this value if we want to. Again, this is not something that you should tamper with unless you're prepared to do it on all the routers. Uh, just stick with the defaults at the CCNA level. The built-in defaults are very efficient and they will get you to do what you want to. Okay, now he's done this to uh, 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 that cost between R1 and R2 was one link and the cost the other way, the two sides of the triangle was double the cost and he shuts down the link and after the network reconverges, you'll see that you now have a higher cost value because it's gone to a less suboptimal route. Okay, hello packets. Hello packets are transmitted by default every 10 seconds. By default, the dead interval is four times the hello interval. Dead means if I fail to hear four hello packets from my neighbor for 40 seconds, I declare him dead, and any routes he gave me access to, I have lost. And I want to try and go away, go around another way, try to find another path. So multi-access networks, point-to-point uh, uh, -point networks, this is by default 10 seconds and 40 seconds. You are allowed to change this. If you wanted super fast conversions, you could change it to 5 seconds and 20 seconds. Uh, it would be more processing time and more, more packets sent back and forth. Warning, if you change the hello intervals on one router, you must change them on all because routers will not establish an adjacency with each other unless the hello and dead timer values match, plus the IP address, plus the subnet mask, plus the interface type, things of that nature. So we can check this. He types show IP, OSPF interface, and he sees that the hello timers are the default of 10 seconds and 40 seconds. No need to change these. If you type show IP OSPF neighbor, he shows you the time starts counting down. In this case, the dead timer has counted down to 35 seconds, which means five seconds ago he got a hello. This particular other network, the dead timer is down to 31 seconds. He got a says hello nine seconds ago. If, the, if we pull the wire loose, he would count down to zero, and then he would declare that link dead.
we can interval we can change these intervals if we want to don't do it unless you're prepared to do it on all the routers uh, you can change them from the defaults of 10 to 40 by using these commands on the particular interfaces that they're using on that not recommend if you do it right now so here's an example of what I recommend you don't mess with he changed the hello interval to different times and what happened immediately that they didn't match with each other and the link went down from full to down on this neighbor until he goes to the other router and repeats the same exact command they'll come back up again okay very important topic we have done this before all routing protocols will do this all routing protocols have the ability to propagate the default route this is the command where you put in the ip route 0000 000 000 000 000 000 000 000 and put in usually it's a serial port or ethernet link port to your isp or to the home office and then you want to propagate that route to all the other routers. So you don't have to go and trap this command over and over and over again. If it's three routers, that's not hard. What if it's 100 routers? So instead of typing 100 commands, one command on 100 routers, if I could type two commands on one router, that would be easier. So what I can do is uh, I specify the default route. Again, in the real world, it would probably be an Ethernet port or serial port. Then I'll go to my router process and I'll specify the... Uh, Default inf information originate, and that says we're running an OSPF process anyway. It's already sharing our internal networks already. Have it share that default route to all of the other routers with the same metric that it was on the original router. And then when we go look at the other routers, we'll see that, that information has been shared. So on the first router where I created the static route, S star, gateway last resort's been set. Here's the default candidate static route, which means that any routes that are not specifically in this router, will be shared to all the other routers, uh, to that particular loopback port address. So when we look at all the other routers, it says it's a type 2 external OSPF, OSPF, which is a special type of OSPF advertisement that maintains the metric. You know the metric here was one uh, static routes. He doesn't show it here in the bracket, but uh, it's a metric of one. And so here we see 110, the administrative distance for OSPF, and the metric is one, which will override any other metric typically. So now you've uh, distributed the default static route to all the other routers and everybody in the entire company, just not the people attached to R1, R2, will be able to get to the internet or get to the home office. Okay, some verification commands. Show IP, here's my two favorite commands. Show IP interface brief, for short. Make sure all the interfaces are up and up. You put the IP address in, you didn't fat finger it. As an alternative, use show prot protocol, which is easier to type, which as a bonus shows you the subnet masking information. IP interface brief doesn't show that. Then we'll show the routing table to show IP route and make sure that the routes are in the routing table. If they ain't in the routing table, the router cannot deliver them. He drops them unless you've established a default route and then it's sent to the default route. Okay, then with OSPF, we can do show IP OSPF neighbor. See if we have our directly attached neighbors. Show IP protocols. I showed you that on Packet Tracer. Yeah, that's how I caught my mistake. I did two OSPF processes on one machine. Uh, show IP OSPF and show IP OSPF interface. Show us some other information like who's the designated router, who's the backup designated router. So he's typed show IP OSPF neighbor. He's seen, this is the same slide we saw before. The dead timers are counting down. He sees his directly attached neighbor. If you don't see your neighbor in there, You've made a mistake with IP address or subnet mask or didn't do a no shutdown or wiring error or something of that nature. You need to troubleshoot that. Okay. And adjacency is only possible if the subnet masks match. If the hello timers and dead timers match. If the OSPF network types match. It's kind of hard to plug a serial port into an Ethernet port. Hard to get that one or you didn't put the network command in properly, or you forgot to put the network command in. All has to match. So show IP protocols will show you this. They'll show you OSPF processes running, which networks have been uh, uh, advertised to the other networks. The administrative distance of 110 has been set. That's the normal default. So that's one way you can check. Show IP OSPF will show you some other information. What's the process ID? What's the router ID? Shows the area information and the last time that the shortest path first algorithm was executed, which normally should be um, within the last 30 minutes. 
show IP OSPF interface shows you, um, in this case, it's a point to point based network. I like this command because uh, when you do show IP OSPF neighbor, you don't see what kind of router you are. Am I a DR? Am I a BDR? Am I a druther? I just see my neighbors. Show IP OSPF interface will show me um, who the DR and BDR are if it's a multi access network. In this case, it's a simple point to point network, so there is no DR or BDR. Show IP OSPF interface brief. And in this case, he's shown us their point to point based network. It would show us the DR and BDR if they were present in this particular network. Okay, we ain't doing that. I think, okay. And at the end of each slide in this module, there's a little review of terms and things of that nature. But what I want to do now is stop sharing this and going back and share. Okay. And I want to share the application packet tracer. And we're going to create this topology for this um, single area OSPF and see if I have a little bit better luck getting this with the physical point to point thing. Okay, I'm looking at the, what is what I'm looking at? Let me show this for a second. Uh, uh, I want to share the first page of the lab so you can see what it looks like. If you don't have the lab report, convenient. So um, I'm going to step through a couple, do a couple things in this lab. I'm not going to perform the entire lab for you. You should do that and turn it in yourself. But let me show you some of the gotchas with getting this going in Packet Tracer. So we've got uh, two routers, R1, R2, and we have two switches. And uh, there's no PCs in this one. He's just using the loopback ports. So I'm going to stop sharing this and read the packet tracer application itself so you can see it. Latency. Okay. Um, I'm going to click on the routers. And I'm going to bring in the two routers. And then I'll try to increase the size of this resolution on the screen so it's not so terrible. And then I'm going to bring in some switches. So I click on the little switch icon down here, and I'll bring in our regular old standard 2960 switch, like just like we have in our real lab here. And let's make those a little bigger. Oh. And I'm going to make the connections on here. So on the first page of the lab, it spe specifies. Now, you have the option of using the 4000 series labs. They're down here. Uh, you can use them if you want to have it exactly match the lab. You can do that. But I'm going to use the 1941s because that's what we have in our room. That's what I'm used to. That's what those uh, interface numbers are. They're G00 instead of G000 and so forth. So I'm going to click on the, uh, before we use the lightning bolt point to point zero link, I'm not, I don't have to provision any zero ports now. I just use Ethernet ports, so I don't have to go in and turn the spar off and put that in and all that jazz. So I'll just click on the point-to-point -point one, and we're supposed to go from G01. It says G001 on the lab. We'll make it G01. By the way, on the back of all the labs, there's a comparison chart between the 1841, the model 1941, the 4000 series routers that gives the interface port numbering scheme for each one of those. And we're supposed to connect to port 5 of this switch. The link lights are red. They'll probably stay red because I haven't done the no shutdown on this yet. But when I create this link between the two switches, it's supposed to be from port one of this switch to port one of this switch. And they're going to probably turn green in the 30 seconds after the simulated STP session takes place. And then the last connection is the point to point connection between port five of the switch, second switch, and G01. <clears throat> no configuration required on the switches apparently in this lab. So um, look, STP finished and the green links came up between the switches, just like it would in the real world. Um, until we do the no shutdown on the router ports, they're not gonna come up. So for example, switch one says, Port one is plugged into this, and port five is plugged into this, and so forth. 
Okay, let's bring up the first router and do some basic configuration on them here. I want to go to the command line. You guys are being really quiet there. Hope everybody can still hear me. Elijah, were you, could you reconnect? Can you hear? I hope. Okay, say no to the setup routine. And while I'm doing this router, is the thing I always like to do first is go to the privilege exec mode and then go to the global configuration mode and then go ahead and apply a meaningful host name so it, I know where I'm at. I've already shown my ability to lose my sanity and do something on R2. I should have done the R1. So let's try to see if we can keep this uh, uh, straight here. Okay, R1 has got... Um, Oh, yeah, uh, I forgot to say that to you guys. Uh, 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 TCC Information Services is saying, please use Chrome. Uh, uh, as a backup, um, um, Google Chrome, track you like a dog, is the number one choice. Uh, Mozilla Firefox sort of works, uh, but they recommend Chrome, and it's a free program you can download. Okay. Um, I'm in R1, and R1, I need to configure this G0 one port. Lab says G001, but if I type interface G0 slash 0 slash 1, he's going to go, what? What? No way. I don't know that. So it's just 0 slash 1. And then I'll apply that IP address that's specified in the lab, which was uh, 10.53.0.1 and our normal submit mask. And then I'll go interface loopback one, and he's supposed to be IP address of 172.16.1.1. Did I forget? They only did what you want them to, not what you meant them to. Uh, the loopback port does not have to be shut down. So if we do a show, Oh, in the alternative protocol, it tells us that the loopback port is up and up, but that gigabit 01 port uh, does have the IP address, but I didn't apply to the shut, no shutdown command to it. So I'll go back into the configuration mode, interface gigabit 0 slash 1, and do the no shutdown command. Now I'll go to, let's go to router two, R2. Go to the CLI. Looks like it's blank again because I started the new project. The privilege exec mode, go to the global configuration mode and give them a host name of R2. And interface gig. 0 slash 1, his 0 slash 1. IP address is 10.53.0.2. No shutdown. Interface loopback 1. IP address um, 192.168.1.1. And it should not have to be shut down. So we'll use our traditional command show IP interface brief. And good. Gigabit 01 is up and up. Loopback 1 is up and up. Now, I probably should be able to ping the other device here because we just gone th through two unconfigured switches. Um, but if I type show CDP neighbors at this point, my only neighbor is my directly connected switch. CDP neighbor can't see jump past the first directly connected device. <clears throat> so if I went to, if I did to, to switch two and switch one, we haven't configured them. He has no host name yet. They have the normal default host name of switch. Um, they would only show the directly connected neighbors. However, if I do a show the IP routing command, since the other router R1 is connected to me through that 10.53 network, in theory, I should be able to ping across my point-to-point -point link to the 
53.0.1. And the heart stopping dot, because ARP had the resolve to the layer two MAC address to the layer three IP address. If I subsequently repeat the command, of course it works fine. ARP holds on to that for a couple of minutes. So we have direct IP connectivity between the two devices because they're all in the same IP address. Okay, in the lab, he tells you to do, I, I, oh, I gave it away here. So all that bonus to you guys that watched, came today and log in and watched the session. Uh, step two, uh, step two, part A, assign a device name to each router. Blank, blank, what is that command? Of course, it's the host name command, R1 and R2. Um, I'm not going to do some of these. It says do no IP domain lookup. It says enable secret class and the pos passwords. In the I'm going to skip those in the interest of time here. Service password encryption. We'll skip that. The banner message of the day. Backup with copy run start. Uh, the switch is the heavy do stuff there, but this lab will per work perfectly well if you don't do anything to the switches. If you want to do shell CDP neighbors and give the switches those names, it would make that work. But let's skip to part two and configure the. Uh, OSPF process. So of course you have to tap the no shutdown command to turn the interface up on that part two, step one, sub part little a. And I've done those commands. I've configured the IP addresses on the gigabit ports and the loopback ports with the caveat that he says G001, you'll just say G01 if you choose the 1941 router. Okay, let's do, let's see, he's going to go R1, R2. I'll do it on R2 first since I'm already there, then I'll jump back to R1. He says type the command. Go to the configuration mode. Router OSPF 56, he says. Any arbitrary number should be fine. Now let's give it a router ID. So the router ID for the router 2 is going to be 2.2.2.2. .2 .2 .2. And then the network command is going to be 10.53.0.0. And then the backwards mirror image of 255.255.255.0.0.0.0.255. And place everything in area 0. I'll go to router R1 and repeat that. Okay, good. He's working like a real router. Router ID is on this router one. is supposed to be one 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 one. And then let's put it on network attached statement fifty n dot fifty three dot 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 two five five area zero. Hey, it's working this time, guys. It didn't work on my point-to-point -point network before. I'm getting the adjacencies back and forth between them. Um, okay, on R2 only, we're supposed to add an extra step. According to, I'm on page five of the lab right now. Let me go back to R. Let me go back to R2. Please don't let me do this. Uh, okay, this is R2. Does this work? Mumbo jumbo. Okay, on R2 only, he says add the configuration necessary to advertise the loopback one network into OSPF one. We have two options here. Uh, I'm going to use the network statement because that's most familiar to us. So network 192.168.1.0.0.0.255 area zero. Advertise it to his neighbor because we only advertised the 10-dot network. We didn't advertise the loopback port yet. Now we're supposed to go to, let me see, let me do this. Go to the first router. Let it blind you. On the first router, we're supposed to show our IP OSPF neighbor. And indeed, our neighbor looks kind of like show CDP neighbors. Our neighbor is 2.2.2.2. The neighbor is the DR. What am I? This the command doesn't tell me. It only shows you the neighbors. It's a dead time. I got three seconds ago. I got an update. 
Now let's go to the other one and see if we see a similar thing on it. We're on router, go to the second router now. So IP OSPF neighbor. From R2's perspective, he's 2222. Two, two, two. We can't see this from this command, but we can see that the neighbor's router ID is 1111 and he is the backup designated router. So we saw earlier that R2 is the designated router. Okay, he's going to have you do some configuration bandwidth and stuff like that in place. But I wanted to try this to see if this command works in Packet Tracer. It's a show IPO. SPF interface, and there was a form of brief, I think. Oh, all right. So show IPS interface. I like that command. I repeat that again. Okay. So show IP OSPF neighbor. Only show me what my neighbors. If it's a DRBER, I like this command show IP OSPF interface because it tells me that oh, here's the exact identity of the designated router two 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 higher number than 1111. Here's the exact value of the backup designated router on this particular multi-access interface network that we have, which is the only one we have between router 1 and router 2. OK, the left as it as the expression is, we left as an exercise to the student. And so please work through this lab. Save it as a Microsoft Word document. Uh, append your name to the file name, save as with your name in all capital letters so I can see it easily. Send it to me and I'll put that little number one check mark in your MyTCC Blackboard to know that you've done the lab. And um, please look through the second module, or rather module three, chapter three, module three, security. And um, when we meet again on Thursday, I'll cover that material as well. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and stop the application now and cut you guys loose and uh, look forward to meeting you guys again next Thursday. Okay.